want to introduce the crew we have here today. My name is Brett Greener, a partner at Bonfire Ventures, and then prior to Bonfire, we're a seed stage uh, VC company that invests in B2B software companies at the seed stage. Uh, prior to that, I spent many years in software, including uh, more than a decade at Salesforce.com. But uh, to my left is Melanie Filet. Interesting, we've got three amazing founders here. They all are a certain type. They were all practitioners in their craft who were so frustrated with the problem, they started a software company to solve that, which is an archetype that we love to invest in at Bonfire. So to my left is, you gotta yell, ladies. Um, uh, Mel, who's a biz ops enablement enthusiast, turned CEO of Speckit, which is a just-in-time enablement platform that delivers contextual, personalized coaching and enablement to revenue teams directly in their flow of work. After experiencing the pains firsthand of scattered resources across different repositories, ineffective onboarding, poor sales process, she decided to simplify and meet reps where they work with the answers they need. Launched in 2018, Speckett has raised over $60 million and helped hundreds of teams transform how they enable their teams and fast track adoption of change. That's an intro just to spice things up. I, I'm gonna ask each of the founders two questions. One, Mal, first question is, what is something about you we wouldn't know if we read about you online? Tell us something interesting. Um, probably that I didn't live in the US until college. So I grew up in Geneva, Switzerland, I'm very Swiss, uh, and then moved to the Caribbean for my dad's job. All right, so it's your first big user conference. It's spec it for us. Lights go down. You're walking up on stage. What the hell is your walk-up music? Not Afraid by Eminem. Okay, Not Afraid by Eminem. That's a strong, strong call. Mine was uh, Remember the Name by Fort Minor, but you have to cut it off at certain parts because there's some curse words in there. Directly to Melanie's left is Shiloh. She's the CEO and founder of Compliant, cutting-edge digital tax assistant helping small business owners the simple way to manage all of their business taxes in one place. She had a decade of experience as a CPA. She's seen firsthand the stresses and hassles that affect small business owners around managing their tax. Launched in 2020, Shiloh is one of less than 100 black women to ever raise over $13 million in venture capital. Congrats, Shiloh. Thank I also you. want to say, uh, I think it's for better, but Mel and Christina would say for worse. I am on the board of Christina and Mel's uh, companies. Shiloh's the one that got away, so no. I'm still, I'm, I don't hold any grudges don't though. She's here why. on stage. <laughs> but, but Shiloh, uh, tell us something about you. I couldn't read online. Oh, I despise chocolate. I'm certain it tastes like dirt. I'm you don't like chocolate? Oh, no. Mm -mm. Dark chocolate, milk no. chocolate, mm -mm. white mm -mm. chocolate, mm -mm. no chocolate. No. All right, tastes like it's dirt. It does. Walk up song? Oh, uh, Beyonce moves. Okay. All right, and then Christina, serial CFO. Sounds weird, serial CFO. Uh, turned founder, CEO of Cube. Spreadsheet native FP&A platform helps companies hit their numbers. Two decade finance veteran, startups through public companies, and was a former uh, finance digital transfer lead transformation leader at Deloitte. After a disastrous personal experience with leading FP&A solution, which is generally the case with most people, Christina set out to build the next generation of planning technology. Launched 2019, Christina has raised nearly $50 million and helped hundreds of companies around the globe go from numbers to narrative in record time. So Christina, tell me something weird about you. There are so many things, I don't know where to start, but um, I am the math nerd and a family of artists. My dad played lead rock guitar in the 70s and 80s, and he'll tell you he was one of the top bands in Buffalo. Uh, my mom writes poetry. I have a sibling who's a guitar player, another one who's a chef. Uh, and my first toy growing up with, was a cash register. So I did not get the creative genes at all in the family. Wow. In my family, my parents were nice. It was a difference. <laughs> so uh, what's your walk-up song? Um, this is from back from my CFO days is uh, our Super Bowl queen, Rihanna. Bitch better have my money. Great. Wow. Nobody can hear us, so we can curse as much yeah, as we I mean. want. It's awesome. <laughs> we could sing. So uh, I put this up here because my favorite quote in working with founders is this one from Mark Twain, which is, we ne you never learn from success. We only learn from failure, right? You put your hand on the 
on the grill, you burn your hand, and hopefully you learn you shouldn't do that again. All knowledge comes from, you know, the mistakes you've made in the past. And we think about startups, especially sort of zero to 25 million. When early days, it's about 99 days, 99% failure, 1% success. And then increasingly, you want to get to some point of more success than failure. But the key is fast learning loops. How quickly can we learn? Did this work? Nope, that didn't work. That was stupid. Let's not do that again. Oh, that seemed to work. Let's do more of this. Uh, and so hopefully in this session, we've got a fast learning loop for each of you. Each of these founders are amazing founders, but they're authentic. And they're going to share um, what's worked and what's not worked for them. And hopefully you can get some knowledge that if you're a founder in the room, you can skip over some of these mistakes. So let's kind of get into it. So the number one thing that's come up from the, in talking to these founders, now, if you don't like this session, it's not my fault. You can blame Sam Altman. I asked each of them, what are the top 10 mistakes they made? And I was sitting around like, what the hell am I going to do with these three lists? I threw them into chat GPT, and it came out and said, these are the six most common ones. But I did go back, and it didn't hallucinate. Uh, these are pretty common. So the first one is really about not hiring the right person at the right time. And the biggest difference between great founders and okay ones is their ability to attract amazing talent. It often feels like a full-time job because it is a full-time job. Founders are often like, well, I've got to do this, I've got to do this, I don't have time to recruit. And I try to tell them recruiting is a full-time job. So, but getting this right is damn hard. It's been really hard over the last five to seven years with inflated salaries, people that don't want to work more than four days a week, that don't take constructive criticism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the other reality is who you need to hire changes dramatically. When you're, you know, 1 million in revenue, 5 million, 10, 20, it's really hard to get that right. So I'm going to start with Mel. So let's start with you, right? You're an amazing team now, management team. Wasn't always this way. And so you had a lot of fits of starts along the way. And so can you speak to that journey with maybe some tips to the founders out here? Yeah, absolutely. Can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. Um, so just for a little bit of context, we didn't raise out the gate. We raised a little bit of angel funding, but it took us about two and a half years before we raised our seed round. And so the painful part of that was that I didn't have the luxury to hire execs early on. And so if you're in that boat as a founder, it's a painful process, but one that I look back that I think has really helped me now be able to have the kinds of conversations with our execs that are really, really important. Being able to challenge their thinking and ask the right questions. Um, but I'd say the biggest learning that I've had when it comes to hiring execs is one, getting really clear on your own leadership style and the kind of execs that are going to work well with your style. And if you're a first time founder, you might be developing that leadership style as you go. And so that alone is going to kind of shift the kind of folks, especially execs that you attract to the company. Um, but a couple of the mistakes I've made is the desperate hire, right? So that's when you know someone unexpectedly leaves or there's a gap in the organization you have an immediate need that you want to fill and rather than going through the proper process of vetting and getting really clear on your problem and looking through a lot of candidates the easy candidate shows up right for us that looked like for example a customer that loved our product saw that i had just posted the um the job and because they loved our product i was like oh that's great they get it they'll be able to communicate it etc and in retrospect, right, they didn't have the skill set that we were really looking for to scale. And so that's the kind of mistake that you can kind of get into if you're really acting off of your gut and enthusiasm versus really getting clear on the hiring process. Um, another example of that that I think I did differently this time, and he's actually in the crowd, is uh, last year in, uh, in May, my co-founder stepped away uh, from the business for personal reasons. And we'd really divided the business. I led go-to-market, she led R&D. And so now we had a void from a head of R&D standpoint. We were all set at a time in the company where we desperately needed help in that area. Um, and I immediately spoke to our uh, now head of R&D and it was, I got very excited out the gate. But I'd made the mistake before of hiring the first person I talk, talked to and realizing that it wasn't necessarily the best fit. And so rather than repeating that same mistake, I told myself that I wanted to get to at least the final stage with a total of three candidates to really do right by the business and ensure that I'd properly vetted all the different kinds of skill sets and, and folks on the market. And so we went through that process. We pressed pause. We spent about two months 
continue to con have conversations, but eventually coming back to that same candidate. But I think it brought a lot of confidence in me that I was bringing in the right person. And so I'd say the biggest piece is just getting really, really clear on what you're trying to solve and not acting too quickly based on your immediate need. And me spending that extra two months in the business, continuing to get clear on our challenges and our problems, ultimately led me to the right decision. So I'd say those are some of the... Great. Christina, you've changed your process for how you hire new employees, especially your leaders. In fact, you, you asked to meet for lunch today and you gave me like <laughs> a very detailed portfolio on a candidate and going through a process, but you've changed your process, especially how you vet your leaders. Can you speak more to that? Um, a few things that I learned that are very, very common mistakes. Number one, if you have the funds, you've raised venture capital, you wanna invest in your people, which is the number one investment, do not be cheap, hire the recruiter. If we're talking about executive level hires, the worst thing we can do is say, I'm gonna look through my network, have it take six months. You'll find out that the quality of people that'll come through recruiting firms is substantially higher, I think, from my own personal experience. I've certainly recruited people through my own network, but there's a reason they charge so much money, it's because it works. It also allows you to focus more time on the candidate itself, themselves, than the sourcing process. So that's number one is don't be cheap, hire the recruiter if you can afford it, if you have the money. Um, number two, don't be afraid of the back channel. Um, basically, if you wanna to come to work for Cube, it's like this, we stick the CIA on you. I mean, not really, but <laughs> we sort of go and make sure we, we talk to other people you may have worked with in the past. But you learn so much um, from these types of references versus direct references who may you know, they came from the candidate, they may um, feel pressured to say only positive things. Um, and then the third thing is, uh, once, you, once you are checking references, that you ask the really tough questions. In fact, I set up my own workbook in advance for doing back, uh, not only back channels, but reference calls, to ask the type of questions like, um, how would you recommend I manage this person? That'll sometimes get some of the challenging answers around what this person needs to work on. Or if I saw you at a party in six months and I said it didn't work out with this candidate, what would be the reason why? And the reason why we go through all these lengths is because um, resumes and interviews are one thing, um, but you're really trying to see if they're the right fit for your stage company um, and have they done it before? Do they have a history of promotion? Um, have they stayed at companies long enough to make an impact? Because we'd like for people to stick around for a little while. Um, and so we go through a pretty robust process, but the folks that we have are just top tier. And bringing in great executive leaders means other great executive leaders want to join you as well. Thank you, Christina. I'm going to go to the next question because I think I took 30 minutes to do intros. Um, a big challenge we see this um, across a lot of companies is in the, in the pace to like grow as fast as you can. Quite frankly, to appease VCs, they were asking all founders to just grow revenue at all costs, whether it made sense to or not, which is really disconnecting from your customers as you scale. Very early on, you're very focused on finding ICP, narrowing down a customer, because it's really key when you have, you've raised the seed stage to go to an A, you've got a limited amount of capital, so you kind of got to focus on one ICP. But then you start getting success, you start adding a bunch of people and a bunch of money, and you start potentially taking on or building a lot, but then you sort of disconnect. And what I say is you fail to protect the kernel. What makes you uniquely special? So Shiloh, let's start with you. Can you speak to instances at Compliant where you felt like your team was working in isolation with customer's voice? And what led to that? And how did you course correct? And what tips would you have for other founders here? So I think I was the one that was the most insightful about the customer and their voice because we, we serve very small businesses and I am a practitioner, as you mentioned, and so that was my customer segment. I knew them better than everybody in my company did. So there may have been people on the team that didn't know the customers, oh, but I knew them. And I was speaking to them at conferences, webinars. That was our entire sales strategy was me talking in rooms like this and teaching people about tax so that they wouldn't you know, fall privy to some of the tax chaos that we have to deal with today. And that's ultimately how we sold the product for the first year. So the more we started to grow, I had to teach people on my team how to communicate with them the way that I did. And that's when I was like, okay, we have like a scaling communication issue that they don't understand the customer the way I do. So I literally set every single person in my company to get on the phone with a customer. And it became our customer discovery project. And it was like, you need to hear from their voices, the words they're saying and how they feel and think about tax 
so that we can action our decisions, whether you're on product, engineering, CS, marketing, whatever. All of these folks need that language. And so all of us need to get in front of the customers. It can't just be me. It can't be me knowing all of the language and then me reciting it to you because we're growing. I can't be there. And so I had to change our entire sort of customer communication model so that we could get to a place where we could scale. And it became our regular practice even to this day. Well, it's an interesting question, right? Because you were a CPA before. Yep. You were a CFO before. We've t I've talked to both you, Christina, and Shiloh about this, which is you guys are uniquely good at talking to your customers because you were that customer. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you feel the need to have to like do a basic tax 101? Because you can't hire all CPAs. That would be a boring-ass firm, right? But like... What? Yeah, we actually have this thing. It's called Taxopedia. It's literally like a notion page of like everything you could ever care about. That's like simple early education understanding of tax. We even teach this to our customers. A little bit of this problem is like we have to tell people they have a problem. Like, you know, you have to pay a business license in the city of L.A., right? And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. So that serves as like our base. And then we say, here's a software to help you manage it. And so it just works well for us. So our in-house, we use the Taxopedia. We give it out to our customers. It just becomes how we think about and, and speak about tax. Great. I mean, when I look at metrics, if I see close rates dipping or retention slipping, I get a sense that maybe we're pulling away from the customer. Yeah. What I'll say was, I'll ask the CEO, like, well, how many times a week are you talking to prospects to customers? They're like, well, not really anymore. I'm like, well, that's a mistake. And so, Mel, can you speak? But founders are busy. So, like, can you speak to how often every week you feel like founders should be talking to prospects and customers? And what's the best way to do that? I'll say early on, I spoke to them all day long. And then once we started hiring a sales team and now our AEs had managers, and so I wasn't in calls anymore, that disconnect grew significantly. Um, and so now I'm on three to four customer calls per day right now, and I kind of mix it up between customer QBRs. Um, and that's kind of a way for me to stay in touch with how our customers actually unlocking the value of our product, what feedback do they have. That's where I pressure test our roadmap. And then I also join deals at the demo stage, basically, uh, where we're kind of unveiling the solution and speaking to their challenges. Um, I will say that one of the biggest mistakes that I made early on was, or I'd say when we were really growing post Series A to Series B, was stop uh, getting CC'd on all of our support tickets. There was a point in time where you're like, you know what, I don't need to be CC'd on all of our support tickets. Uh, I've got a support team, they've got it. Uh, and Last May, I woke up one day and it's like, oh crap, we've got all these like little paper slices across the product that I wasn't aware of, but in aggregate became a real problem. And so now I'm back BCC'd on every ticket, you know, that we get through Zendesk and it's just a way for me to really keep tabs on the quality of our product and identify the patterns that might not get surfaced at the top. And so there are certain small things like that that you can do to ensure that you're keeping the right kind of pulse on your product quality, um, as well as on the voice of the customer. I remember Dan's in the audience. Um, in the early, at least for the 12 years that I was at Salesforce, now with remote may be different, outside of Benioff's office was always the SDRs. So every time you walked in and outside of his office, you could hear the cadence of the call track, and how the conversations went. So it kept them connected. Um, Christina, how do you ensure your team, right? You're now north of 100 employees. Um, how do you make sure your team, especially leadership, stays close to the voice of the customer? Um, we make sure that our, that our employees understand our customer. So when you're hiring in certain functions, you need to hire experts in that function, not necessarily industry experts. So we evangelize fp &A internally. So we have a campaign going on called fp and Slay where we're training all of our team and providing education, um, showing customer videos, having customers talk to our teams to make sure that they not only understand the customer, but they fully empathize with them. And then the way that I ensure that this is happening is I stay very high level and then occasionally go very, very deep to sort of trust and verify that what the team is saying matches up with our metrics. All right, next one. If you're a founder, you know this. Right? It feels like you are involved in every function, but you have to find the time to pull up and understand where you're going. It's really hard to do. Uh, so let's start, and getting this balance is not easy. But Christina, it's a topic near and dear to your heart. You love this stuff. I love you it. Love, you, you love being on the business, uh, but you're also very good in the business. Can you speak to this balance between getting shit done and sharing your head on the right path, and what's the biggest impact you see when you don't? 
I was um, talking to a fellow founder over drinks and I was complaining about like how busy my calendar was, how much stuff I had to do. And he sort of checked me and was like, your job at CEO is to do a lot less than that in theory. It means that you're, you're not working on the right things if you're that busy. Um, so there's really three jobs for the CEO to work on the business versus in the business. The first is to set a very clear vision and strategy, become the chief repeater officer, and repeat it over and over again until people are rolling their eyes. And even then, you're probably on the right path. So number one is make sure that you set a very clear vision and repeat it often. The second thing is to hire the right team. So back to the first um, the first answer, making sure that you have the right people and you're bringing on the right people. And then the third one is repeat number one and two indefinitely. Um, so you're always focusing on the people and making sure you have a very clear vision. Anything else, diving too deep on the path, you know, post two million to 10 million, means that you're probably working too closely in versus on the business. We're always deep diving, especially if an executive leaves and there's an open function, but in generally, staying at the 30,000 foot level ensures that your team can go deep. Um, another way I've heard this said before is as CEO, you're focused on the what and your team is focused on the how. Great. I'm going to ask both of you this question. Cowbell, somebody wants something. Exciting. So, look, running a company, uh, you could work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But you probably should. So how do you manage your energy and time? How do you prioritize your own tasks, ensure you're focused on the most critical areas, but also give yourself enough time? Because otherwise, you just turn in, people just turn into spazzes, right? They can't sort of reflect. So I'll start with you, Shiloh. I am not as good as Christina about making sure I'm focused on the things that, you know, working on the business. But I think what I try to do is hyper-focus on the tasks that matter in that moment. I'm very much moment to moment. I don't know if I can think too far past this week. In fact, I'm only looking at my calendar for today. And then I try to time block, and then I only focus on really the top three things I need to accomplish in that day. And everything else, I'm either delegating or moving on to another day. Mel? Um, I'd say similar to Christina, I kind of look at the business each quarter and look at what part of the business do I really need to lean in on. This quarter is sales and marketing, um, and so I'm going to spend the majority of my time there with our go-to-market leaders, et cetera. And so I try and identify, like, what is the biggest problem that we're having in the company and where do I need to really spend my energy and time? And in terms of being intentional with my time, I'd say I'm very much a work in progress. Um, probably my background, biz ops, like, I just love the actual act of solving problems and getting my hands dirty. And I have I feel like I've been challenged in the past. And the CEO of MongoDB, I think, said it best. You know, when you think about your team and most people, they'll do what you inspect, not what you expect. And so I've tried to really find the balance of what is the right level of inspection that I need to have in different parts of the business to make sure that there aren't blind spots, that there aren't gaps, that there aren't things that are happening that you know, are going in a different direction so that I can surface to the top and similar to you finding the right people. Melanie, I mean, uh, Christina, part of this working in and outside of the business is people get the balance if they have the right cadence, right? Everybody should just use the V2 model, but everybody refuses, Dan, to use the V2 model. I don't know why, but, but what works best for you in setting the proper cadence and format with your management to review performance, right? Um, and, and decide yeah. on course corrections. So we are very, very focused around a planning calendar. And if everyone doesn't have this in your business, I recommend you get one. Um, everything revolves around our cycles so that there's less thinking about the cycles that we need to have. So we have a quarterly board meeting. We have our quarterly OKR planning. We have our quarterly OKR reviews. We have department level reviews. It's all planned out in a calendar. There's an owner for it. That'll help you take time out from figuring out, oh no, we have to do this thing we haven't done in a while and it sort of runs itself. So that's a very important part of being successful, going back to planning. Failing to plan is planning to fail. So have a plan, put it in the calendar. Great. Uh, no one did this over the last five years. Um, chasing growth. Uh, I don't know, for the sake of chasing growth. Uh, look, founders, are you're focused on growing your top line as fast as possible. Uh, the venture capital industry tells you to go do that, right? Double, double, double. If you don't do double, double, triple, 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 double, double, you're a loser. You know, it's like some weird show of like uh, Talladega Nights. Like if you're not first, you're last. It's actually not true. You know, there is second, third, and fourth. 
In fact, at the Players' Championship, the number two won $15 million at the PGA this year. But look, you, you want to make sure that your planned growth is achievable and sustainable. And going for growth before you do so sucks. Like, I'm sure it's never happened in this room, but you go, you raise money, you tell the VCs, I've got it figured out. You hire 10 reps and then you realize, yeah, oh shoot, I don't have any pipeline for these people. And then everybody's sad. And then they say the company's broken. And then, every, you know, that never happens. So, but if you wait until everything's perfectly ready, you're never gonna grow. So this is really, really hard. And this is hard at every stage. So let's start with you, Mel. What yeah. do you say is core for any founder to have confidence in before putting the pedal to the metal and say, investing in your sales teams? Well, here's where we went wrong. Um, if you got to your two million number, you probably had one or two reps, very involved founders, right? Your product went from baby product to evolve. They gradually learned. You were doing a lot of co-selling with them. You learned, they learned how to sell the way that you sell and how to position, et cetera. And once you raise your series A or series B or whatever you know, that money is, next the conventional wisdom is, great, now if you want a three X, right, we need to grow by let's say 5 million. Let's assume, you know, because one rep we have was able to do a million dollar quota, let's assume that we need this many reps in this ramp schedule and boom, let's go higher. What we learned the hard way is like, that's just not gonna work that early. Once you have enough reps that have gone through the ramp schedule and that you've actually seen like, what is their ability to create pipeline, right? Unless you're the exception, you have this like insane inflow of demand gen that's just fueling your reps with like ready to close deals. Maybe you can assume that, you know, your first two reps are model reps for the rest of the reps you're gonna hire. But the reality is it's probably very different. And the amount of time and effort and enablement and coaching and everything else that goes into taking your next, you know, let's say three to 10 reps to productivity looks very different than your first few. And so what I'd recommend instead of kind of looking at the model and arbitrarily hiring reps based on, hey, this much quota, this ramp time, et cetera, is like, look at their calendars. Look at their calendars. How busy are your reps' calendars? How many deals can a rep actually be working at once and mix your top, you know, top, uh, top down approach at modeling with your bottoms up. And take a very kind of gradual approach at hiring because the problem is once you start hiring a bunch of reps, then you need managers. And before you know it, you're completely disconnected from what's happening on the ground. You don't know if someone isn't ramping because of the market, the customer, the product, is it the bad fit rep? Um, so I'd say I would take a much more bottoms up approach at hiring the next few reps beyond your first couple to get it right. And I'd also recommend, I got this advice early on, I can't remember from who, but always hiring reps in pairs because it helps you identify basically like if there's something, if someone's off, right? Because it's rare that every single rep you're going to hire is going to be the right fit, but hiring them in pairs helps you kind of gut check, right? If they're receiving the same training, if they're receiving the same kind of coaching, are they actually ramping at the same scale? So, um, that's that. That's a great answer. Uh, Shiloh. How do you know, in theory, oh, I've got repeatability in marketing, or I figured out this SEM strategy, or I figured out this. Okay, now we know, let's throw money in. How do you know, or maybe you don't know, you have repeatability in a function, right? Yeah, um, I think for us early days, we don't have sales folks, we are product led, so it was all sort of test, and if, it, if they bite, we repeat, bite, repeat. And so early days, we were just trying to find models that work, so we were testing a lot of stuff. And if anything, even halfway signaled like it was gonna be successful, we were jumping on it. Like, okay, let's go 10 toes down on this thing, let's double bid, what, add keywords, let's write a blog, let's do whatever. And so that just became our cycle, and so much so that the numbers started to become outlandishly obvious. So it was like, oh wait, we can clear 100 new users in one week because of this keyword strategy or this landing page is converting 30%, great, let's shove money in. So some of it became really obvious because the things that weren't working was like one. So we were like, okay, that doesn't work, that's not. So that's the thing about product-led is a little bit different in the sense that you get to let the user or sort of the person like flag or sort of trigger when it's time to dump money into it versus having a sales structure where those folks are responsible for sales. It's really the user that's responsible for the sale. They're telling me when they want or like what they like about the messaging that they're willing to buy. And so we're just watching what messaging works and then shoving money into those things that work. I don't know how scientific that strategy is, but it worked. <laughs> so something worked, let's do more of it. Yep. If it doesn't, let's stop. Try and try again. What was the first 
Yeah. That was the first five years of the Salesforce operating playbook. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> there were no blogs or for us to read. Uh, five, this is hard. So you set up your plan. We have our plan in our spreadsheet model. It looks perfect and it's beautiful. It's got all the magic number, everything that, you know, uh, David Sachs likes to see. And then you miss. But the question is what to do. And we think that the founders that are the best in the industry are both agile, is that they know when to respond to plan under overperformance and adaptive. And they know how to operate must change at different inflection points in the company. So, Christina, let's start with you. You're a former CFO. You're more than well versed in the world of planning variations and forecasts. In fact, you're in the business of making that even far easier for companies. You've said before, failure to plan is planning to fail. So can you speak more to this? Uh, I'll start with saying I think the number one misconception or mistake that people make with planning is assuming it's the same as forecasting. Like a plan doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna hit it perfectly. And if it were, I think all of us people who consider ourselves planners would be in Vegas and we'd be gambling. It's not the same as forecasting. What makes planning, what makes a good planner is the ability to respond to changes very quickly and having multiple plans for multiple scenarios. So even in our business, when we're slightly off plan, we'll know in advance of when that the end of the period hits. So we'll look at predictive measures and we're constantly measuring and able to adapt in real time to that speed. So one of the things we tell people when we're looking at plans is don't focus too much on whether your forecast was 100% right or wrong. Obviously that's very important, but if it is off, respond very quickly so that you can get yourself back on course. The other thing is I always tell all folks when you're planning for revenue especially, you should always have three versions. You're most likely, the version you tell the board, and then what you, what you have for your company plan. So there's a, a quota attainment, there's a company plan, that's the number that you evangelize to the company, um, and then a board plan. So you have a little bit of room in between for goal setting and also for in case you miss your plan, you don't necessarily run out of cash, you have a little bit of a hedge. So all this is about setting yourself up for success, knowing that no one is a perfect forecaster, no one knows what's gonna happen in the market. We've all seen too many unforeseen events. It's about the ability to make changes quickly and constantly. Thank you. So Mel, let's assume you're going through, you decide, we need to make a change. But making change is hard when you're north of 100 employees. How do you align everybody? Now everybody's not in the same office, they're remote, et cetera. So do you have any advice for founders like they need to make a change? How do you make that change to get people rallied and, and execute against that? I don't have a perfect answer. It's difficult. Um, I will say that as a leadership team, I think we've gotten a lot more effective at working together all towards the same goals. I see our head of R&D nodding over there. Um, I think in the past what was happening is that we'd set OKRs, but we very much took the department approach like, okay, sales doing this, marketing's doing this, r and is doing this. Um, and there was just natural misalignment that was happening as a result. And so now this year we've taken a different approach, which is you've kind of got like these four core themes. Um, so one of them, for example, this, uh, this quarter is around driving the impact home of our solution spec. It, right? How do you measure the ROI and impact that we drive? And under that goal, we have sales, marketing, and R&D each contributing to it. And that's really helped us just as an executive team get rallied around it and then be able to translate that down to, to the rest of our teams. In terms of big changes, I will say that um, erring on the, the side of transparency is really important, but also just knowing kind of the order of communications and how it needs to, to go down. I think in the past, one of the mistakes we made is that some of the bigger changes were getting communicated to our managers like maybe hours before they were getting communicated to the broader team, right? Even if our exec team was on board, managers were not given the proper amount of time to be able to really respond. And that's a big change that we've, we've made is to really try and bring managers more into the fold and give them a bit more advanced notice because ultimately they're gonna be the ones on the ground that are responding to questions with their team. So, um, again, small, but trying to find ways to ultimately align the people because that's where, where it all starts. I like that idea of aligning the functions under the themes. All right, we're going to leave some time for questions. The last one, and this is the hardest one for all founders, which is not trusting your own gut and expertise. 
Founders forget that venture capitalists invest in the founders first, business idea second. Um, and you have this weird thing as a founder that as you scale, everyone's like, I need to hire a management team. I need an experienced management team. And so then you go and hire the pros and then you're in a meeting and you're like, I think the pros friggin' wrong, but you're supposed to delegate, you're supposed to empower, uh, and getting that balance is really hard. Um, and so I'm gonna ask the same question to each of you. I'll start with Shiloh. Um, can you talk about a time when you should have listened to your gut and you didn't? And then second, two, two-part question. Do you have any tips for when you have a gut feeling? Because if you've got a gut feeling as a founder, it's going to eat you alive until you either validate it or dismiss it. Yeah. So we'll start with you. I think um, for, the per for the first part of the question, it starts a little bit with determining what's your like, gut and what's just negative self-talk. So as long as you can differentiate what that is, if there's just something there and you're not quite sure what it is and you need to figure it out, that's one thing. But if it's just you telling yourself a story that probably doesn't really exist, um, that's a whole other thing. So it's making sure you can hear the difference between the two, I think has been important. Um, I actually trust myself a lot. <laughs> I trust myself a lot more than maybe I should, I don't know. Um, so I, I will bet on things that I believe to be true that everybody in the room will say like, you're crazy, why are you doing that? And then later down the line, it will make sense. And then they're like, oh, we didn't see. So I think the one time I didn't do it, someone said to me early on was like, I had this thought how I was gonna hire. I was gonna hire all these ICs. Cause really in my mind, I was like, I just need people to do work. I don't care if you're a chief, whatever, you know, there's three people in this company, figure it out. So I didn't think about it that way, but now that we've gotten so large so quickly, the, someone said, you need to hire ops. Like that needs to be the first person. I'm like, I don't need ops, I need someone to code. Like, no, 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 you need ops. And I just did not listen, <laughs> I did right. not trust. And I should have, and something in me was like, maybe they're right, and I went against it, and we paid the price, because now we need an ops person, and I'm drowning, I'm so busy. Um, but also just reminding, that was a reminder to me, like, you know what you need to do. And when you feel it and you believe in it and you can validate that to other people and explain that to your board, who's usually the ones that want you to justify why you're making whatever decision you're about to make. And if it makes sense to you and you've got a group of investors and backers that really support you and what you're doing, they'll believe you, they'll ride with you. As long as you can make it make sense to them. Now, if it's not making sense to them or anybody else, you may want to reevaluate, but I think as long as I trust it and I can connect with the people that I trust and explain that reasoning and they see the logic in it and they're not poking holes in it. When people start to poke, poke holes in, in my, then I'm like, okay, there might be, I need to rethink this. There's too many people thinking maybe this isn't a good, good idea. But for the most part, like you've got to sleep with you. You've got to look in the mirror and, and be okay with the decisions you're making. And no one's going to say like, oh, you get a pass because so-and-so told you to make that decision. You're the CEO, so you've got to own it. And part of that is trusting your gut. Chris, it's funny, I remember having a conversation with Christina when I was like, you need ops. She's like, we don't need no ops. I admit, but as a former ops person, I was, you know, as a former ops person, I was offended by that. But Chris, Christina, that was a little unfair. So Christina, uh, how do you validate or dismiss your gut? How do I validate or dismiss it? Um, I think you told me this once, which is you have to trust it. It's usually right, that's why it's a gut feeling. Um, I think the better question is how do I validate or, or how do I push back or yeah. work with someone else who thinks something differently than my gut? So number one, if it's someone on my team, I think it's really important to give the team trust even if you know maybe they're not necessarily right. And then what you can do with your team is, let's say you have like five sil silver bullets for the year. Like there may be five times this entire year where if I disagree with something, I'm going to say, okay, this is some one I'm going to die on the hill for. Um, and that way, at least you get a certain number of passes to trust your gut when it really means something. Otherwise, you give your team the opportunity to either succeed or fail because sometimes they need to learn that lesson for themselves. Um, but you have to know how big of a, an issue it's going to be, which is why you get those silver bullets. And if it's a board, for example, you also have to remember that sometimes it's great advice coming from folks who've seen the space, but you're in the trenches every single day with your team and your customers. So figure out what's worth dying on a hill for and what isn't. Yeah. Okay. Mel, some parting thoughts? 
Um, I'll just say, when I really think about the times that I've, my gut was screaming and I didn't listen, it's usually come down to people decisions. Uh, I think usually if your gut is telling you that someone's not gonna work out, you should probably listen um, carefully and, and get clear on why that's the case. And I think the more people you hire, the more that becomes a little bit more black and white versus gray. I will say that there's two very specific people um, that are still on my team today, and I'm gonna bring up one who was our original head of CS, uh, where my gut was saying that, you know, I didn't think it was gonna work out. I remember we had a conversation, I'm like, you know, I hired this person, I expected them to know all these things and do all these things, and it's just not, not working. And I remember, I think you gave me the advice, you're like, spend more time with them. And so rather than kind of make that fast decision, I ended up putting a two hour meeting on the calendar every week, and granted we were smaller, where we actually built the process together. Um, and doing that work together helped us kind of find that common ground. And to this day, he's still one of the best hires we've made. He's helped us grow our book of business. He's phenomenal. And so I will say that when it comes to people, trust your gut, but if you're not 100% sure, spend more time with them and really validate that you know your instincts are correct because they're either gonna come out on the other side and surprise you, and it could be the best surprise um, possible, or it's gonna become pretty clear that you know you should probably make that decision faster to part ways. Awesome. So we got some takeaways here. So I wanna, we're gonna do a little bit of Q&A, but before that, I wanna thank these amazing executives on stage here for joining us at Saster.